All right, week three of the 2021 college football season is officially in the books. Great weekend of college football. That can only mean one thing. Today's Monday, and it's time for an updated top 25. That's right, the only top 25 ranking that matters, the Uncle Lou top 25 right now. Oh, uh, yeah, good morning in that, though, but it's Uncle Lou here, though. Yeah, that's right. It's me, Uncle Lou. Guess what? I'm live for you on YouTube today, so thanks for watching. I really appreciate it also in tune addition to that as well. Hey, subscribe to this channel if you're not already. Did you know I post college football videos almost every single day of the year? That's right, and some of them are even watchable. I don't know about this one. You'll have to let me know at the end of the video whether it's watchable or not. It's not up to me. It's up to you, the viewer. Let me know in the comment section down below. You can also let me know which rankings I got wrong and what they should have been. All right, here's a brief look at last week's top 25. There's a top 10 right there. And, of course, 11 through 25. Obviously, we've got some shakeups uh, in the poll, both the 1 through 10 and the 11 through 25. Now, nobody in my top 10 actually lost this weekend. However, I don't move teams around only if they lose. Uh, how you win matters in college football. We all know that uh, to a certain degree. It's a style contest in some weeks. And some of these teams struggled this week and looked really bad, even though they won. So there will be some shakeups within the top 10. One of the biggest debates I've heard uh, since the games on Saturday is, uh, should Georgia jump Alabama for number one? No, and I'm not. I'm not going to make you wait to the end uh, to 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 figure that out. I, I I did not change one and two, but there are lots of changes from three to ten, and lots of changes from eleven to twenty five. Let's get right into it. All right, I always start at number ten, work my way down to number one, and then just show you eleven through twenty five. The biggest complaint I hear about the rankings, uh, other than the fact that everyone thinks every ranking they've ever seen is wrong. The biggest complaint I hear is that there's not an explanation given for why someone ranks a certain team why they do. Uh, where they do. So while I can't do that for all 25 teams, the video would be way too long. I do my best for teams one through 10, not to try to convince you that I'm right, but at least to give you my explanation for why I have a team ranked where I do or why I moved a team up or why I moved a team down. So that's what I'll do. Let's start out this week with the number 10 team, Ohio State. Ohio State won this past weekend over Tulsa 41 to 20 after taking a loss the previous weekend at home to Oregon. They play Akron this coming up weekend. I think Ohio State is a good team. They, they, they probably are even really good. Are they great this year? Are they elite? Are they as good as they have been the last couple of years? I think that still remains to be seen. The Big Ten, of course, is a tough conference, regardless of what some you know idiots will try to tell you. I do think the Big Ten is the second best conference. I don't really think there's another conference that even comes close. Uh, to the Big Ten in terms of being second behind the SEC. So it's no easy road to go into feeder to get the Big Ten title game. Ohio State has managed to do it most years in the playoff era. Can they do it again? They're going to have to run the table to have any shot at a playoff. Now, the Oregon game doesn't count against Ohio State in terms of the Big Ten standings, but they've still got some tough games coming up in the Big Ten with Michigan, Penn State, and Michigan State. All three of those teams right now are undefeated, and I think the argument could be made for a couple of those teams that they've looked better than Ohio State. Ohio State continues to concern me some on defense, and C.J. Stroud continues to concern me a little bit on offense as well as Ohio State's running back situation in their running game. Not that I think C.J. Stroud's not any good or not that I think the running backs aren't any good, but compared to last year's Ohio State team, Obviously, there's a drop-off at the quarterback position. I mean, that's to be expected. You're losing uh, Justin Fields. He was, you know, a top pick in the NFL draft, an all-world talent. You're bringing in C.J. Stroud. And while he's got a ton of talent, he just has no experience. Before this season, he'd never even thrown a pass at Ohio State. So there's reason, if you're an Ohio State fan, to think that this Ohio State team is going to get better as the season goes along. And if that's the case, I could see a scenario where Ohio State finishes 11-1. and And if they do that, that means they will have big, impressive wins over teams like Penn State, Michigan, and Michigan State, and then we'll see what they do in the Big Ten title game. So is our Ohio State's playoff chances down the drain with that loss to Oregon a couple of weeks ago? No. Whether it's fair or not is not the point, but when you're, when you're one of the big marquee names in college football, 
generally speaking, you can absorb one loss if it's to a good team. Now, Ohio State's been left out in the past with one loss, but that one loss was against what people considered to be a bad or not so good teams, Purdue and Iowa. This loss to Oregon, at least right now, looks like a good loss, if there's any such thing um, as a good loss. Oregon, pretty good team. They're ranked really high in both the AP and the coaches' poll. We'll see where they come at in here. But this week, I've got Ohio State at number 10. At number nine, I've got Texas A&M, and I still have some concerns about Texas A&M offensively. They looked horrible two weeks ago against Colorado. We're lucky to get out of there with a win. Quarterback uh, Haynes King went down in the first quarter of that game. Backup didn't do all that much. Now, Texas A&M's defense is lights out. Uh, Georgia seems to be getting most of the talk uh, in terms of having the nation's best defense. I hear people talking about Clemson. I don't hear that many people talking about Texas A&M, and I think Texas A&M's defense deserves to be in the conversation for one of the best defenses in college football. Last year, they had the number one defense in the SEC statistically, and they returned most of those players this year to that defense, and they've been playing real good all three games. The defense has played great uh, in all three games. They won this weekend against New Mexico 34 to nothing, and even in that close win over Colorado, the defense played great. I don't have any issues uh, with Texas A&M's defense. The questions about Texas A&M to me uh, are on the offensive side of the ball, and of course you can't help but look down the road at their schedule, right? You know there are games coming up with teams like Alabama and Ole Miss. And this week they play Arkansas, one of the surprise teams in the SEC last year, and I think a team this year that has taken a lot of people by surprise. Uh, they're undefeated, and they've looked good doing it. They've got a really good quarterback that's fun to watch, They've got one of the best offensive lines in the SEC, and their running game is legit. They're tough and hard-nosed on defense. It's going to be a tough game this weekend for Texas A&M. They're going to have to come up with some kind of offense to beat Arkansas, in my opinion. I don't think they can count on winning this game 7-3 to or 10-7 to like they did against Colorado. I do think Arkansas will be able to move the ball some on Texas A&M. Now, clearly this will be Arkansas's most toughest test uh, or toughest test of the season so far, too. So we'll see how they do in a big kind of marquee game where everybody's going to be watching. One of the best games of the week, in my opinion, coming up, Texas A&M versus Arkansas. That's a neutral site game in Dallas. Jerry World played at Cowboys Stadium. But I've got number nine, Texas A&M this week. At number eight, Clemson. I dropped them all the way down. I believe I had uh, Clemson third in my poll last week, if I remember right, or in my ranking last week. Just really no way to justify Clemson's offense anymore. Maybe you give them a pass week one uh, because we all know now Georgia has one of, if not the best defenses in college football. It was the first game of the year. It was a top five matchup. I feel like both coaching staffs and both offenses in that game uh, played a tight game, took very few chances in that game. So I think if you were looking to make some excuses for Clemson's offense, you could find some to make in that week one game against Georgia. Not the case this past weekend against Georgia Tech. And I understand that there was a two-hour weather delay and that that sometimes can have a weird effect on a game. That was at the halftime. Um, and Clemson's offense was terrible in the first half of this game before the weather delay. I'm not sure what's going on with DJ Ukulele. He looked pretty good last year in the two games that he started when Trevor was out. He threw for almost 800 yards in his two starts last year against Notre Dame and Boston College. And so far this year, he's just really, really struggled. To make matters worse, Clemson's offensive line is absolutely horrendous. Um, I don't remember seeing a Clemson offensive line this bad, at least not in the playoff era. You'd probably have to go back to Dabo Swinney's early years as head coach at Clemson in the late 2000s in early 2010s to find an offense this bad at Clemson. Um, they've got elite playmaking wide receivers, but with DJ not playing well and the offensive line really not giving him a whole lot of time to sit in the pocket, they haven't really been able to utilize those wide receivers that they have, and they're relying on a freshman running back uh, to carry the load. It's just been a struggle for Clemson offensively, and we're just out of excuses for Clemson at this point. Uh, Georgia Tech is not a good team. They lost to Northern Illinois in week one, who's a really, really bad team. And uh, they had to hold on to beat Georgia Tech this past weekend, 14-8. to eight. Clemson had a goal line stand near the end of the game to kind of hold on and win that thing. Not a good performance for Clemson. Not a good look for Clemson. That combined with the lack of offensive production in week one against Georgia, and there's a lot of people who are kind of jumping off the Clemson bandwagon. Now, the good news is, if you're a Clemson fan, there aren't very many, if any, 
elite teams in the ACC, not named Clemson. North Carolina was supposed to give Clemson a run for their money this year. They lost week one to Virginia Tech um, and didn't look good. Miami is in the toilet. Florida State's circling the bowl. Um, Virginia Tech lost this past weekend. Uh, Pitt and Boston College haven't looked as good even as people thought they would. Uh, you know, Duke, Wake Forest, NC State. I, I, the, the, the ACC really is in bad shape right now. Clemson was sort of keeping that thing above water the last couple of years. If they don't get things turned around, then it's possible we look back at this season and say that the ACC was the worst conference overall. But I've got Clemson at eight this week after that narrow win at home or that narrow win against Georgia Tech, 14 to eight. This week they play on the road at NC State, another team that's not very good. Another opportunity for Clemson to get their offense going. We'll see if they can do it. If Clemson comes out for a couple of weeks in a row and looks like they've got things figured out offensively and they start putting up some points and moving the ball, they'll probably end up moving back up in the rankings as teams ranked ahead of them lose. We'll see. But uh, it, it's 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 hard to rank Clemson this week. Um, it's hard to rank three through ten in my mind this week. I think one and two are obvious. Maybe some people argue about the order of one and two. But 3 through 10 is a crapshoot this week. You could put teams 3 through 10 in a hat, really, just draw them out at random and place them that way. But I've got Clemson at number 8 this week. At number 7, I've got Iowa, and I believe I had them at 7 last week as well. And they had a good performance this weekend, 30-7 to victory over Kent State. They play Colorado State this coming up week. I was impressed with Iowa again this weekend, and I thought about trying to move them up. And it's not that I don't necessarily think they deserve to be higher, um, it's just when you look at the teams ahead of them, some of them had good wins too, or I think maybe are just a little bit of a better team. But Iowa has had a pretty good season. They destroyed Indiana in week one. They won the rivalry game against an undefeated Iowa State last weekend, and they did not have a letdown this week against an inferior opponent, which we have seen some teams do. Um, we have seen some teams do that. Clemson against Georgia Tech. Oklahoma has struggled against some bad teams. Not Iowa. They played a bad team. They handled business 30-7. to They play, like I said, Colorado State this week, likely to remain undefeated. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But I've got Iowa at number seven. Coming in at number six this week, I've got Oklahoma. And I had to move them down. This is, in my opinion, two bad games that Oklahoma has played out of the three that they've played. They really should have lost that game to Tulane back in week one. And I kind of gave them the benefit of the doubt because last year when Oklahoma played bad games, they lost. They lost two of their first three games to inferior opponents. And I said, well, at least this year they found a way to win. Um, and then they looked good last week against a nobody. And then this week, Nebraska, which technically a nobody, in my opinion, not a good team, got beat by Illinois back in week one. And it was a struggle for Nebraska for four quarters. They struggled to move the ball against Nebraska. Um, Adrian Martinez was the best quarterback on the field, and that's a problem. If you're Oklahoma and you're getting and your quarterback is getting outplayed by Adrian Martinez, that's not a good sign because we all kind of know what Oklahoma's defense is, even if it's a little bit better than it has been in years past, and I do think it is a little bit better. If Oklahoma doesn't have an amazing offense, they don't have much shot of, of uh, doing anything past the Big 12. Um, I think we all know that and understand that. Spencer Rattler, probably the worst quarterback that Oklahoma has had in the last five or six years. And I know they've had some amazing quarterbacks, so that's maybe that's not a fair comparison when you're talking about people like Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts, and now Spencer Rattler. From what I've seen for Spencer Rattler so far, he's not in the same league as those other QBs, and that, that's a problem. They've got issues at running back. And defensively, at times, they look much better. Uh, this is second year now for new defensive coordinator Alex Grinch. I thought they made big improvements last year. I was expecting a huge leap forward on defense for Oklahoma this year. And like I said, at times in each of their three games, I have seen Oklahoma's defense play the way I thought it would. The problem is there are large parts of these games where the Oklahoma defense is like a, a switch is flipped and they just revert to 2017-2018 versions of the Oklahoma defense where they're out of position, um, they look unsure of themselves, uh, the poor fundamentals, you know, can't tackle, can't wrap up, and this just keeps popping up uh, for large sections of every game Oklahoma plays, and you just can't have that if you want to get where you want to go. And, and when you're Oklahoma, where you want to go is a national title. They've made the playoffs almost every year that we've had the playoffs, but they've yet to win a playoff game primarily because of their defense. Um, the problem I see this year when I look at Oklahoma, 
I think they've got some tough games coming up on their schedule down the road. They've got to play Kansas State, who's beat them two years in a row. They've got to play Texas and think, you know, we can say whatever we want about Texas. That's a rivalry game. We'll see how it goes. They've got to play West Virginia, Iowa State. Uh, Texas Tech and Baylor have looked decent. There are some landmines on the schedule for Oklahoma. Spencer Rattler does not start playing better. If that offense doesn't start clicking and the defense stays like it is now, I could see Oklahoma dropping a couple of games. We'll see. But I've got them at number uh, six this week in my poll after beating uh, Nebraska 23-16. to They play this week at home against West Virginia. We had a big win last week against Virginia Tech. West Virginia yet to beat Oklahoma since joining the Big 12. Will this be the year they can do it? We'll see. Uh, that game comes up this weekend. Uh, now we're getting into the top five. I left Cincinnati at five. Um, I don't know what else people want Cincinnati to do. Um, they're in the conference that they're in, and there's nothing they can do about that. They try to schedule the best Power Five opponents every year that they can. Let's be honest. There aren't a lot of Power Five opponents lining up right now to play Cincinnati. There's no benefit, really, to there, well, not really at all. There's no benefit at all for a Power Five opponent to schedule a good Group of Five team. All the benefit is for the Group of Five team. Well, uh, Cincinnati did get two Power Five teams on the schedule this year. Their first of those two opponents was this past weekend, Indiana. Now, I'll be the first to admit, Indiana is not as good this year as most people thought they would be. They were ranked in the top 15 preseason, and in week one they got actually, uh, absolutely destroyed uh, by Iowa. Cincinnati comes out and they win the game, 38-24. to Cincinnati's got to be careful, though. This is the second week in a row where Cincinnati has basically slept walk through the first half. Cincinnati was getting not just outplayed, but dominated by Indiana in the first half of this game. Uh, their quarterback, Ritter, was out of rhythm. He looked bad. The Cincinnati defense wasn't playing well. Indiana was moving up and down the field. Second half, just like last week against Murray State, was a totally different story. Indiana was, I think, tied, or Cincinnati, I mean, was, I think, tied with Murray State two weeks ago at halftime 7-7. Seven to seven before winning the game 42-7, to so exploded in the second half. And we saw a similar thing this week against Indiana. Indiana dominated the first half of this game. Cincinnati was asleep. We go to halftime. Teams come out for the third quarter, and it was a totally different game in the second half for Cincinnati, and they pulled away and won the game by two touchdowns, 38-24. to So score-wise, I think that's pretty good. However, for people that are watching Cincinnati play every week, do they look like a dominating elite team that should be considered for a playoff spot down the road? I don't know. Uh, they can't keep crap in the bed for half of the games and relying on miraculous second-half comebacks. They're off this coming week, and then they play Notre Dame the following week, and this is the game for Cincinnati, the Notre Dame game. And it sets up good form, too. Notre Dame is going to have a tough, physical, hard-fought game this weekend against Wisconsin, one of the most physical teams every single year in college football, both offensively and defensively. Win or lose, I expect Notre Dame to come out of that game a little beat up. Then they got to turn around and play Cincinnati. Cincinnati is off, so they've got two weeks to prepare for that Notre Dame game. If Cincinnati is or wants to be considered for a playoff team, if Cincinnati is or wants to be considered amongst the elite in college football this year, they have got to come out and beat Notre Dame, a Notre Dame team that has not looked impressive at any point this year. Two three-point wins to start the season for Notre Dame against really bad teams, and then this past week they beat, uh, was it uh, Toledo? Uh, whoever it was they played, and uh, they did not look dominating in that game either. Notre Dame looks vulnerable. Cincinnati, if they want to be taken seriously, they will beat Notre Dame in two weeks, but we'll see. I've got them uh, at number five this week. I left them in the same spot as last week. And now that brings us to my top four, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and show you the top four like I normally do all at the same time, and then I'll talk about them in order. I moved Penn State all the way up to number four. Now, I had Penn State at number 10 last week, and so, and so there's going to be people asking, how can Penn State move from 10 to 4? when they played an Auburn team that was ranked in the 20s? Well, that's a good question. In my opinion, if you look at the teams specifically in the top five, okay, I don't think there's a team that has two better wins than Penn State. Penn State went on the road in week one and beat Wisconsin. That's Wisconsin's only loss, and I believe Wisconsin to be a top 15 team. They then beat Auburn this past weekend, 28-20, to at home. 
Uh, and I think Auburn is probably a top 20 team. Now, I'm not trying to convince anybody that either one of those wins is as good, say, as Oregon's win over Ohio State, okay? But those, when you look at, you got to remember, most teams have only played three games. Those are two good quality wins for Penn State. That's why I decided to move them all the way up to number four. Is that too high? Maybe. But like I talked about earlier, the Big Ten East is an absolute juggernaut this year. Yeah, so Penn State, you know, those two, those two wins are good, uh, Wisconsin and Auburn. They still have to play Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, and a handful of other good to average Big Ten teams. Not an easy road for Penn State. But I felt like through the first three weeks of the season, considering they had two really, really good wins, I think – the two, you know, I don't think there's a team that has two better wins than that. Considering that it's impossible, really, to try to figure out who should be three through ten, I decided to show Penn State some respect this week and move them up to number four. All right, at number three, I've got Oregon. Oregon's got probably the best win of the year on the road at Ohio State. Georgia's win at Clemson is looking less impressive by the day. I just have to be honest. Now, it's I still think it's a good win. But even if you consider it a great win, it was on a neutral field. Oregon beat Ohio State at Ohio State. I just feel like that's the best win so far in college football. Um, we kind of wondered about Oregon after week one when they struggled and only beat Fresno State by seven points. Turns out Fresno State's a pretty good team. They dominated this past weekend. Oregon did. Now, they got off to a little bit of a slow start, which maybe that's to be expected after traveling from uh, the West Coast all the way to the Eastern time zone to play a game, back to the West Coast, playing a nobody, celebrating the big win over Ohio State. They struggled out of the gate early against something called Stony Brook, but they pulled away in the end and won 48-7. to So, again, I know uh, Stony Brook's a terrible team, not on Oregon's level, but I say this a million times. I'll say it a million more times. When you're a great team or a good team and you play a terrible team or a bad team, the best you can do is blow them out. That's the best you can do. You can't make that team better. All you can do is blow them out, and Oregon did that. They won the game 48-7. to Um, They're undefeated. And another reason why I think Oregon deserves serious consideration to be somewhere in everyone's top four, the Pac-12 is falling apart. Uh, it looked great a couple of weeks ago. UCLA had beat LSU. Well, they lost to a nobody this past weekend. Uh, Southern Cal, everyone was high on them. Well, they've already got a loss and fired their head coach. Washington was in the top 20 in most preseason polls. They lost to an an FCS team in week one. Utah lost this past weekend. Arizona State lost this past weekend. It's really Oregon up here in the Pac-12 and everyone else down here at this point. And that didn't appear to be the case a couple of weeks ago. So it looks Oregon's path is looking easier and easier. I really think people need to consider getting Oregon into the top four if you don't have them in your top four already, if for uh, no other reason. At the end of the year, if they're either 13-0 with a Pac-12 title or 12-1 with a Pac-12 title, I I really think they're going to get into the playoffs. I think Oregon can probably absorb a loss at this point because they will have that Ohio State win to fall back on. Um, We'll see. But Oregon clearly the cream of the Pac-12 right now, and I feel like this is a fair ranking for them considering where we're at in the season. I've got them at number three. And I left Georgia at two and Bama at one. Uh, Georgia played an overmatched South Carolina team and absolutely destroyed them 40-13. to Uh, Alabama played a pretty good Florida team on the road in Gainesville and was lucky to get out of there with a win. I will admit, and there are a lot of people, Bama fans included, in my comments section who have been telling me for the last two days that Georgia should now be ranked ahead of Alabama. If somebody wants to put Georgia ahead of Alabama, I don't have a problem with that based on what we've seen on the field so far this year. However, um, I think Nick Saban has earned the benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't know what happened in Gainesville. I'm not necessarily surprised that it was a close game. But there are bigger concerns to me if you're an Alabama fan and you watched that game. How is it that Alabama got pushed around on the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball by Florida? 
How is it that Florida was able to run the ball down Alabama's throat and there was nothing Alabama could do about it? Florida has been one of the worst rushing teams in the SEC for the last several years. Now, I know they've got a running quarterback now, and that helps. But it was hard to understand how Alabama's lines of scrimmage were getting manhandled, and they were. Um, Alabama scored on its first three possessions, and the rest of the game was an absolute struggle. Um, This was Bryce Young's first true road game. Maybe that had something to do with it. Anyway, that's why I decided to leave Alabama at number one. In the end, they did come out with a win. In the end, they're going to have more tests. And if Alabama is not as good as we thought, um, they're going to lose some of these games coming up on their schedule. Now, not this week. They play uh, Southern Miss, and Southern Miss is is terrible. They're one and two, I think. Uh, Bama will win this game by 40 points easily. But the week after that, they play Ole Miss. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I almost put Ole Miss in my top 10 this week. I I don't know if there's a team I've been more impressed with than Ole Miss um, based on where my expectations were heading into the season. Everyone knew what Matt Corral was going to do. Everyone knows about the Lane Kiffin offense. Ole Miss's defense, there's not a they're the most improved defense in all of college football, Ole Miss. That that Alabama Ole Miss game in two weeks is going to be something serious. Um I will tell you this about Alabama. All this talk two weeks ago that, oh, oh, Alabama's clearly the best team in college football. They're miles ahead of everyone else. No one's got a chance against them. All that's out the window now. Uh, And the Alabama fans would agree. Um, How do I know that? Well, I've been reading my comment section for the last two days, and the Alabama fans are not happy with that performance against Florida, and they're worried. And I think for legitimate reason. Um, Ole Miss is going to be a problem for Alabama in a couple of weeks. Now, it's a home game for Alabama, so that obviously helps a lot. But look at last year's Ole Miss-Alabama game. Alabama's offense was way better last year than it is this year. Ole Miss's offense is better this year than it was last year. Alabama's defense we thought was great this year. But what happened this past weekend? Was it a glitch in the matrix? I don't know. We'll find out. Ole Miss's defense, light years better than what they were last year. And Ole Miss gave Bama one of its toughest games of the year last year. Ole Miss and Florida. And we saw what Florida did to them this past weekend. So I left Bama at number one because I just it, it's Alabama, it's Nick Saban. That was a tough spot to play on the road in the swamp. Bryce Young's first ever road game. Um, so I felt like leaving them at number one was the right thing to do. If you disagree with me leaving Bama at number one, that's fine. If you think their defense really is a problem, if you think Bryce Young isn't all he's cracked up to be, don't worry about it. They'll lose to Ole Miss or Texas A&M or LSU, or Auburn, or whatever on down the road, and we won't have to worry about it. But for now, I felt like it was the right thing to do uh, to leave them at number one. My thoughts on Georgia after the first three weeks, the offense I think is getting better every single week, which is exactly what I thought would happen. And we still don't have any of our injured players back. Those five or six players that sat out the Clemson game are all still out. Starting tight end Darnell Washington. Starting wide receiver Kiaris Jackson has been returning punts. He did play wide receiver some this past weekend for the first time. I think he played a handful of plays and had one catch. So they're working him back in. Wide receiver Dominic Blaylock still has not played a snap. Wide receiver George Pickens still has not played a snap and probably won't till November. Uh, Starting safety Tyke Smith, who was an All-American last year and according to Pro Football Focus, the best returning safety in all of college football, yet to play a snap. Um, so Georgia's offense is getting better every single week without still the majority of its offensive weapons, at least in the passing game. Defensively, their lights out. The front seven might be the best front seven Georgia's ever had. There is not a better front seven in all of college football than Georgia's front seven, and that's just a fact. Um, Georgia's issues are in the secondary, just like everybody knew and everybody thought they would be. It's inexperience, and we've seen it. Uh, several times this season, uh, both against UAB and South Carolina, actually, some of Georgia's young corners getting beat deep over the top. Now, Georgia's pass rush negates a lot of that. You really only have two choices when you're trying to throw the ball against Georgia. It has to be a quick, a quick slant or something like that where you're you know, shotgunning, you're getting the ball out of your hand in one or two seconds. Or you got a really fast wide receiver on the outside. You send him on a go route. You know, you, you're the quarterback. You, you, you hike the ball, shotgun quarterback, one step back, chunk it up in the air. There are there's just not time for any developing pass route, uh, uh, routes against this Georgia defense. If you're a quarterback and you try to sit back in the pocket for three or four seconds, you're just going to get eaten alive. 
Now, that has helped Georgia's secondary. However, when the teams have been able to get off a deep ball against UGA, we've had some problems with it. So I've still got some questions and concerns about Georgia's secondary when we play a team that can really push the ball downfield. When will we see that? Well, not this week. We play at Vandy. Georgia will win that game. They're a 34-and-a-half-point favorite on the road at Vandy. Um, They'll probably cover that spread. But we've got Auburn coming up. Uh, We've got, of course, Arkansas coming up. We've got Florida coming up. Uh, Those are probably the three toughest remaining games on the schedule. We also play Kentucky, who's been slinging the ball around this year. We play Missouri, who's got a pretty good quarterback. So we'll see how this secondary sort of progresses over the course of the year. They're clearly going to have to get a lot better and play a lot better than what they're playing now should they make it to the SEC championship game against an Alabama or an Ole Miss or a Texas A&M, and then, of course, uh, a playoff situation against, you know, an Oregon, uh, an Ohio State, whoever whoever it may be that's in there, an Oklahoma, whatever, that's going to be slinging the ball around. The good news is, like I said, I do believe in the talent that's in the Georgia secondary. I just think they need more game experience. We lost six defensive backs to the NFL draft just last year. We lost six NFL uh, defense. We lost six defensive backs to the NFL last year, and we had two transfer out. There's just no experience there. You know, we got some five stars, but they're inexperienced. They're sort of uh, on the job training here these first two or three weeks of the season. But just like Georgia's passing game is going to get better, I think, as we get our starting receivers back. I also think Georgia's secondary can get a little bit better as these guys get some more experience. They got uh, they got a week, uh, another week here against Vandy of sort of a warm up game. Uh, then I think it's I think we play Auburn after that. Uh, then I think Arkansas uh, and, and on and on from there. So the schedule gets a little tougher for Georgia after this coming week, as it does for Alabama with the game against Ole Miss coming up in two weeks. Ole Miss has a bye week uh, this week, by the way. So they get two weeks. Lane Kiffin gets two weeks to game plan and scheme uh, for Nick Saban and Alabama. I think that is going to be a hell of a game. Um, that is going to be a really, really good game. Could Lane Kiffin become the first Saban assistant to beat him? Maybe. I'll tell you this. If Ole Miss and Alabama were playing today, after what I saw this past weekend from both Ole Miss and Alabama, I would pick Ole Miss in a close one. Now, I, that doesn't mean I'm going to pick them in two weeks when they actually play. Let's see what Alabama looks like this week. Um, but th- that's going to be a hell of a game. Anyway, that's my top 10. I'm going to put the entire top 25 up on the screen now. I appreciate all of you watching. Be sure and let me know in the comments down below what you think I got wrong. I'll talk to you again real soon. Have a good morning. 